There's no point where you can kind of sit back on your moral leaves and go, yeah, I've, I've got this, I've got my black belt, or what have you. Good day to you, and welcome to Whistle Cake of Martial Arts Radio, episode 280. Today, we're joined by Mr. Gene Ching. If you've never heard my voice before, my name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for this show. I'm the founder at Whistle Kick, Sparring Gear and Apparel. And I'm one of the people behind the scenes helping to make these interesting martial arts products and podcasts and websites come to life. Because I'm a traditional martial artist, as I suspect most of you out there are also. I love traditional martial arts. And I'm dedicating my life through Whistlekick to spread it, help it grow. If you've never been over to Whistlekick.com, you should. And if you're looking for the show notes for this episode, for any of the other episodes that we have, they're all up there for free. WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com You can sign up for the newsletter at either one. And, you know, we should probably send out another newsletter. We don't do them very often because we only send them when there's really stuff to say. You don't have to worry about us spamming you. You don't have to worry about us selling your name or anything silly like that. We just like to have a good way to get a hold of you because you listen to my voice. I don't have a good way to reach through the microphone and talk to you and say, hey, you person, whatever your name is. All right, I'm getting silly. So let's roll forward. Today's guest, Mr. Gene Ching. He's a successful martial arts practitioner as well as a writer, and he's the publisher for Kung Fu Tai Chi Magazine. This was our second go-round with a recording because uh, we had some issues with the first recording. 100% my fault. But, you know, we had, we, I had at least as much fun the second time as I did the first time. And I think the episode came out great. So let's welcome him to the show. There we go. We're here. Are we ready? We're ready. <laughs> <laughs> Round two. Round two. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for coming back. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Like I said, I had a similar thing happen to me once. And, uh, yeah, you, you, you mentioned that. I actually, I shared that story. Um, you know, with just I was lamenting what happened with one of my friends. And, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge rap fan. I mean, I, I grew up with rap music and, and grew up with Wu-Tang. So, you know, for, mm-hmm, for, you, sure. for you to mention that that had happened with, with Rizzo was just like, oh, it's... <laughs> I, yeah, I was <laughs> I was impressed and also would have been uh heartbroken. I mean that that must have been oh, yeah. gut wrenching. Yeah, I mean it was, you know. <laughs> yeah, that was tough. But I mean Riz Riz is a good friend, so it, oh, it cool. worked out okay and he uh he revisited it and it was all cool. Does does you he know? train actively? I mean I, I He does, yes. He does. Mm-hmm. Do you uh do you think you could you could hook me up? <laughs> I don't know, man. You know, I actually haven't talked to him in a couple of years. Oh, okay. um, the last time that we kind of interacted was, was, um, let's see, he was, you know, he's doing that thing where he's doing the live soundtrack to 36 Chamber. Yeah. And um, he was, that was originally going to be a six city tour. And so when he was going to bring it to San Francisco, he wanted me to come out and do a, like a discussion panel. But uh, that, that fell through. He's never brought it to San Francisco. Wow. So. Uh, but that was a few years ago. That was when it was like in the early stages of development, and he was working with uh, Celestial, the Schraubler yeah. company. And um, yeah, so it, 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 you know, since then he's done it a couple times, but not out here on the West Coast. And uh, Riz is like, he's not a guy that that I can call. He mm. calls me, you know. I get it. <laughs> I get it. So I mean, I can call his uh, his agent or his his person, but but she won't only acknowledge me if he tells her to so it's <laughs> it's kind of like uh you know i, I mean i understand it you know i i love those crossover martial artists you know and, and mm-hmm. we have a few of them and they're and they're big and i just i i i'm sure you for for the very same reasons that that i i would love to have him loved having him sure you know, it, it just it, the i think as martial artists it can be validating to us when we look at someone who is famous for non-martial arts reasons doing martial right. arts right 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 yeah yeah i mean um i think there's a, there's a lot to be said for the crossover and there's definitely um 
There's definitely this aspect of martial arts that you should have a complementary practice, particularly in Chinese martial arts, right? So, um, you know, they always say like the, the yin and yang and the wen and the wu, the culture and the martial, right? So, for example, our office here is is adorned with a whole bunch of calligraphy that's been done by various masters and grandmasters that have added to our walls. And we, we only have like about a fifth of it up, so we get so much calligraphy. But it's a very common parallel discipline to to, to Kung Fu is and Tai Chi is to do calligraphy. But then so is music and cooking and or what, what have you. There's all sorts of, um, I think there's, no, there's always something about doing that, that parallel process, you know. Yeah, it, so, and my memory is failing me, but doesn't Kung Fu translate out as something that's not particularly martial? Right. The, the literal translation of Kung Fu is not martial. I mean, it's something that we've we've used in the West to describe martial arts, but um, um, Gong really just kind of means work. Yeah. Like either the word, the word like Gung Ho, it's the same Gong. Oh, wow. Right. Gung, mm-hmm. gung Ho means uh, like work enthusiasm. Uh, the ho means enthusiasm or work, uh, uh, and so so. And then the 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 fu is like a, it's like a the character for man, but with like an extra set of arms raised to heaven. So it's like, it, it sort of deify or makes it divine or makes it sacred. So it's often translated as you know to have a good kung fu. You can have good kung fu in how you play guitar, how you rap, how you you know how you paint, mm. um, any art. And so it's kind of like. Um, or any skill, you know, how you chop vegetables. Um, but it's it's often translated as a skill that you get uh, after a long time of practice and uh, um, many hard hours, many hardships. So it's mm-hmm. it's not, uh, you know, not literally martial arts, but that's that's what we call it here. Yeah, so. it, I, I, I thought that's what I had remembered. We, we had, right, right. We've had a number of Chinese practitioners on the show, and, and that's one of the... I don't know. It seems like when we talk about Chinese martial arts, it it gets broader than <laughs> it gets very than, complex. Than very just, quickly. yeah, yeah, and yes, and, and yes. I I dig that because you know I I I appreciate the way martial arts kind of feathers into life. Yeah, and I think so often people in I, I don't I don't want to draw a hard line here. I'm drawing the softest of lines that I can, but sure, folks sure. outside of Chinese martial arts seems so often to admire what they develop inside their training. But it seems like when, they, when they're done training, it's, it's not there as much. When you hear a Chinese practitioner ch- talk about life and martial arts, it, gets, it seems to get much blurrier. Mm, yeah. Well, I mean, I think, um, well, that nature, that definition of Kung Fu is part of it. And I think also it's, it's so intrinsic to the culture. I mean, if you look at Chinese history and all the dynasties, uh, emperors are classified as either uh, a Wen emperor, a cultural emperor, or a Wu emperor, a, a martial one. And you're, invariably the ones that are at the beginning of the dynasties are all the martial ones because they had to take over and crush out the previous dynasty. So those were the warriors. But then as time goes on, it becomes more of a cultural thing. And, they, you know, the later the later emperors become the one that really contribute more to Chinese culture and developing various cultural aspects. But that's always sort of the yin and yang of it. So it, it's so implicit in Chinese culture that uh, it, it it's it's hard to tease things out. It doesn't separate out in that sort of mind-body Descartian simple mathematical way. It, it's very... Um, it's very uh, connected, and I think that's also why, you know, Chinese martial arts are are cumbersome in many ways because it is so connected. There's so many cultural uh, artifacts within, like the very forms we practice. So, for example, certain weapons. You know, it's not just learning the weapon, but you also have to learn sort of, you know, who used this weapon. And there's there's often, oh, you know, for example, uh. uh the Guandao, which is a giant lance, a giant glaive, that uh, is a very signature weapon in Chinese martial arts. Um, the Guandao is named the Guandao after General Guan Gong. That's the same Guan, and, and he was a, a hero of the Three Kingdoms period. And he had this long beard. He was known for this long black beard. So there's movements in the form where you're throwing the beard over your shoulder or you're mimicking riding a horse with this thing, which kind of don't make sense. 
but uh, but then they kind of do, right? I mean, it's not like a practical thing that you're going to use in the street, throwing your beard over your shoulder, unless you've got a really long beard. But uh, it, it's something that uh, you know that is that is really it's part of the form, you know. And, and, and there's lots of little artifacts, particularly with Shaolin style, where you, you have little nods to Buddhism or even within Tai Chi, nods to, to Taoism that um, that are just built in the form. And uh, I, I think a lot of those movements get, you know, people learn just as when we talk about you only learn the skin of it. If you just learn the skin of the form and not getting down to the muscle and then not getting down to the bone and not getting down to the marrow of it, you know, you just learn the movements, but you know what they mean. You know, there's one level in learning, you know, your applications for your moves, movements for your form, but then there's a whole other level learning the cultural context. And, you know, it gets, it gets really deep really quickly. Mm. You know, I often use the metaphor of the Chinese box, where every time you open a box, you know, there's another smaller box inside. And uh, so there's, it's, I mean, you never kind of get to the end of it. So that that's kind of exciting and overwhelming at the same time. Yeah. I like that analogy, the idea of skin to muscle to bone when you're thinking about a form. And I'm curious <laughs> because I think so many people are, I don't know if I want to say content, but so many people stay on that skin level. And I think because that's where they're taught to focus. Yeah. How, how do you, yeah. How and do I you think talk a, about going deeper? You know, like, is there, is there a process? Like if you learned a form tomorrow, how yeah. would you get from skin to muscle to bone? Oh, it, that, that's digging, you know, you dig and dig and dig. And, um, I mean, I think that there's two things going on there. One is sometimes the instructor only has the skin to pass on, you know? Um, I mean, they may be physically very strong, but never really get to the deep level. And there's really nothing wrong with that. I mean, for example, I think a lot of Tai Chi that's being taught to the elderly is only the skin, but that's enough, you know, that, you know, elderly don't really need to learn push hands and learn all these other, you know, weapons and what have you. They just, they're just doing it to be social and for fall prevention. And that's fabulous. Um, but as a, as a dedicated practitioner, you just got to dig, you know, you, you, you keep researching it. And now, now today it's so much easier. I mean, you can, if you're learning a certain form, you can look it up on the internet and look at YouTube videos. You can, you can break down the characters of, you know, a lot of traditional forms have what's called chanpu, which are sometimes translated to the lyrics. It's like the names of the forms. I mean, like uh, it hails back to that old, uh, you know, the Bruce Lee um, in Return of the Dragon, where he kicks the guys like number nine, dragon whips his tail, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, every name in a traditional form has, or every every traditional form that the sequence has names, and those names are very evocative, you know, and so those are um, those are clues. Those are little fossils that if you pick at, uh, can reveal a lot. You know, sometimes they evoke these great myths about the people that are being inspired or that are supposed to inspire you in these forms, you know, I mean, going back to Guan Gong, you know, if you, if you're interested to, if you're interested in Guan Dao, you know, and you can learn the weapon. I mean, first of all, it's, it's, it's a, it's a huge weapon. So it's not something you really learn uh, for self-defense. Um, I mean, you could argue cause it's heavy that you learn it for, you know, for muscle building and conditioning, but it's not something that, you know, you're, you're not going to have a Guan Dao when somebody, you know, assault you on the street or something. It's it's just not, and there's not going to be anything even like it that you could sort of map those skills to. You're learning it more as a um, as a discipline, as, as an art form, and uh, and so when you when you get that and you figure out that the Guan Dao is is this named after somebody, you look into who that person is, and you know that that will lead you to in this particular case, it leads you to the Three Kingdoms, the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, one of the four Chinese classics, and in ancient literature and you know it's a huge huge novel and so the, then you start getting into history because i mean this is this was this this was a although the, the novel is a is a fantasy it's based on something kind of like arturian legend and uh you know you just keep going and going you know you, you look at the weapon you look at what kind of weapons still exist you look at um you know the modern versions of it versus actual um archaeological versions of it uh, and then you you know you look at opera, you look at you look at storytelling, you look at puppet shows, you know wherever there might be information. I mean, it, it it's it, it's it goes as deep as you want to go, really. 
you know, you'll, you, Chinese history goes back thousands of years. You'll never really get to the end of it. Which I guess so. kind of leads to a question. When we talk about martial arts, especially the, the, the more modern that we can kind of put a box around it and say, you know, this art is 20 years old or 50 years old or 100 years old, <laughs> we can kind of see the edges. You, you talked about you can go as deep as you want to go. You know. Sure. But at some point, I mean, if we can, I don't know if we, we can assume, we can probably expect that that box, I guess we would expect, was drawn out. Somebody at some point defined what that martial art is. But if yet if it's that deep, has it kind of grown beyond what someone set out and thus does it have a life of its own? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think martial arts have to be vital. You know, this is a big thing that that's often advertised, particularly in the Chinese circles, where they, they say, you know, we have the original form. You know, ours is pure. And I think that's an interesting argument because, I mean, first of all, there's no way to validate that. I mean, you could draw some sort of lineage line saying, okay, there's the founder and then his student, his student, his student, and me, or however, how many, you go, however many generations you go back. But um, even on that sense, it's not even... I mean, ultimately, who cares, right? I mean, who cares how, you know, Beethoven composed the Ninth Symphony? What was the exact way he played it? Who knows? There's no way of knowing. There's no recordings of it. And it, and it ultimately, it doesn't really matter. What, what matters is how, how you use it today, right? How you play that symphony today, how you play that form today. You know, uh, you've, you've got to keep it monitored. And I don't know. I mean, there's, there's, I, I think there's, there's some limitation there in that, Certainly, you know, there's this argument where, well, we, we should learn to, 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 to fight with modern weapons, right? I mean, who, what good is using that Guandao today? Because, you know, you, the only place you could ever find a Guandao is in the Kung Fu school. Um, so I mean, maybe I should learn how to fight with the skateboard or the uh, selfie stick or what have you. And I guess there's some validity to that. But uh, at the same time, you know, it, it, it's that root, that connection to tradition, which, which makes it really deep. And uh, you can really take that for as, as far as you want. You know, I mean, there's certainly there's that self-defense thing, which is at the forefront of most people's minds. But then there's uh, a whole other level of it, of culture, tra cultural transmission that uh, has its own intrinsic value. Have, have your perspectives, your thoughts on all this changed over the years? You, between your own training and what you're exposed to, and, and we haven't really even talked about people, what you do day to day, uh, <laughs> but you've, you've got a lot yeah, we of, just in. what's that? You, we just got to jump in. Yeah. Yeah, we did. And you know what? I'm, so, I'm fine with that. You know, honestly, we've had a few cool. of those starting this way and um, yeah. they've been, they've been fun for me because it, it, it just kind of, it's, it's a lot more organic. Um, sure. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious I'm expecting the way you look at martial arts in your own training has changed. How much of that has changed because of your, well, I, actually, I don't even want to ask that follow-up. How has the way you look at your training changed? Oh, um, well, yeah, it's constantly changing, changing. I mean, you know, when I was a kid, it was just something cool I was doing. And then when it kind of became a career, you know, it, it, that, that sort of opened up a lot more pragmatic perspectives. You know, I mean, there's sure there's the, the whole, you know, self-defense thing. Can you take care of yourself? And then there's that business aspect, aspect, you know, can you can you make the rent? Can you uh, keep the lights on in your business? And um, now, I mean, I'm in my 50s. So there, there's that age factor, which is uh, <laughs> probably the most challenging so far. I mean. Uh, when you start, when, when your, your physical, uh, systems start to be less robust, when you don't heal as quickly, you know, you have to kind of reevaluate everything, you know, I mean, and before I would be, you know, doing something like sparring is, you know, that's great fun when you're young and, you know, the next day you feel great. But, uh, when you get older and you take a bruise, some of those bruises don't heal for weeks. And so that, uh. That makes it a much bigger consideration, right? You got to protect yourself in different ways. Plus, certain things just kind of disappear. Like, you know, I'm not nearly as fast as I used to be. I'm not as flexible, not as strong. And at that point, I think is when the traditional stuff gets really important. 
you know, that's when you kind of look to the old masters, you know, these guys that are in their 60s and 70s and 80s and still doing it. And you, and you, and you look at them and like, well, how, how did they solve it? Why didn't they quit? Why, why can they still do it? Because obviously they don't um, have the physicality of, of a younger person. And, uh, and yet they still have the skills. And that, that really gets down to it. You know, they, they have the skills. And so the quest kind of shifts, right? I think it becomes a little less, less macho, uh, a little bit more playing for the long game. Um, I mean, you know, over the years, I, I, there's so many people I know who kind of quit doing martial arts after a certain age or, I mean, we all kind of slow up and change our training, but, uh, yeah, so many people quit and, uh, you know, that's really not being a martial artist in my opinion. I mean, being a martial artist, you can't say, well, I, yeah, I used to do martial arts, you know, or you can say that, but that doesn't mean you're a martial artist still, mm. you know, you have to keep practicing. It's a, it's a day to day thing. It doesn't, um, there's no point where you can kind of sit back on your laurel leaves and go, yeah, I've, I've got this, I've got my black belt or what have you. And I'm, I'm the master and I've got, you know, you have to constantly keep polishing. You got to constantly keep working. Um, How much and, of that, that dropping out, that fading away. And we can look at, you know, a number of different reasons and different age groups and, and all that, but how much of that bears personal responsibility and how much of that is the fault of us as, let, let's say, the martial arts industry, the instructor that has possibly misconveyed, or you know, lately I'm I'm finding myself in conversations that when we point the black belt as the standard, and someone has achieved that standard, you know, we've spent so many years indoctrinating them. That's where they want to get to. That what's the point in continuing? You know, so I I see it as mm. both. I see it as mm-hmm. But I'm curious how much you would ascribe to each side. Hmm. Um, well, I mean, for me, the black belt is kind of, uh, it's kind of a, a non-issue because in traditional Chinese martial arts, martial arts, there is no black belt. I mean, a lot of American schools have established a belt system because they teach kids and it just doesn't, you know, that's just part of marketing. But traditionally, Chinese martial arts, um, it's a folk folk style it doesn't come from the military like like you see with some with the japanese and korean martial arts so um there's no rank there's no hierarchy in that sense the hierarchy is more familial you know it's clan based so you know sifu the the fu can be interpreted as father you know and and you, you call your senior your senior's elder brother elder sister uncle aunt you know younger brother younger sister um so it, it's more clannish and so it's a different it's a sort of a different take on it. And uh, when I did do, I did kendo for a while and uh, I did judo too, but, but I, when I was in a belt system with kendo, you know, they really kind of look at, I mean, you don't, you don't really have a belt in kendo. They do have Q and Don, but, but you don't actually have a physical belt. You know, you're just a certain Q, you're a certain rank. And the way they looked at it, you know, the first, your first Don was when you actually are in the game. You know, that that's when it wasn't like, oh, you get your black belt, you're a master. That's cool. It's more like uh, all the queue were just leading up to that that first dawn. And then then you're now you're now actually part of the community of Kendoka. So so I guess my take on that as a whole is, is different. You know, I don't really um, uh, not that I disdain the belt system at all, but I don't really ascribe to it. I, I can't really relate to it. Um. But I get back to your question, whether it's an industry thing, that that's a really, I mean, I think there's a lot of things, Patrick, you got to, you know, look at, you know, you got to look at what kind of goals people have in their practice. You know, what, what you've got to look at geographic factors, you know, certain areas like uh, the metropolises have much better access to uh, martial arts resources. Sure. Um, uh, so, I, I, yeah, I don't know. That's a, that's a really... That's a tough question. That's a very loaded question. <laughs> I don't it's really okay. have a question. Was, I don't it, really have an answer for you there. That's fine. That's fine. I, so, I like asking those kind of deep loaded sure. questions. And admittedly, you know, that one was kind of out of left field. You know, I certainly wasn't on the list I sent you. Uh, <laughs> okay. let, let's, let's go to one that is, you know, let's, okay. let's go to our, our kind of standard starting question. How'd you get started? How'd I get started? I got started um, 
because uh, my family was kind of involved in it. Uh, my cousin had come by when I was a young kid and uh, with his kung fu team, actually. And uh, they were going to a tournament and they stayed at our house for a little while. And uh, I had this little, when I was a little kid, I mean, I must have been what, like, like four or five. And uh, I had one of these little toy swords, the toy plastic swords, and they broke that right away, which, you know, upset me. But then they showed me like a real sword, a real kung fu sword. And I was like, wow. Okay, that's kind of cool. I'm I'm into that, and um, so that kind of just set me on the path. And um, uh, when I when I at that time where I was living in uh, near Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, and there was like no all that was available was was judo. So I started in judo, and um, which was great actually. Judo is a great starting martial art in that you know you learn how to fall at a young age. That it's good to know how to fall. <laughs> It saved me plenty of times. Um, but then when I moved back here to California, um, I was doing Shotokan for a while. And it was sort of a hybrid. It was Judo, Shotokan, kind of a mix of different uh, styles. And it, it, it didn't it didn't work out for me so well, so I took a little break. But um, but I have, I've always had this lifelong fascination with swords, and I, uh, I kind of came back to that. So I did... Um, uh, I started doing Western fencing and Kung Fu, and then later in college I did... Uh, kendo um and so um you know through the kung fu i got you know all the there's so many weapons in kung fu and that was just you know i'm all i, I love working the weapons i just love the history of them and the, the, uh, they're just fun you know <laughs> and uh uh fencing i i um i got a provost master in fencing and was nc2a at san jose state for several years um and uh you know, and then, you know, along the way, I picked up a whole bunch of other little, little things because that's what you do in the martial arts. It's a constant quest, right? You know, so, I mean, I'm fortunate to be in the San Francisco Bay Area where there's a lot of martial arts. Too much, in fact. <laughs> really? That's a whole Yeah. Scene. Well, it's great. Well, like, for example, right now I'm calling you, or I'm speaking to you from um, the Kung Fu Tai Chi Magazine headquarters, and... So within walking distance of where I am now, um, there are three major schools. Um, there's a, a Taekwondo school, there's a Muay Thai school, and there's a Kung Fu school. And that, that's all literally the same exit. We're right off of the freeway. Um, so, and, so it's almost like it's saturated. And uh, what I think what that, uh, the, 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 the down the downfall of that is that you get these great instructors who are really struggling. You know, I mean, there's, there's, um, there's not much, uh, education when, when in, in, or not much, um, uh, available to masters in terms of, you know, just learning to run their business. You know, they spent all their time learning to master their, their martial art. And while there are like business programs and stuff for martial arts specifically, um, most people don't engage that, and it it makes it tough. You know, they, they they have these strip mall schools, and they're trying to keep the doors open, and uh, there's just so many schools on top of each other. Uh, the competition makes it really challenging uh, to stay open and to stay vital. Um, so, yeah, too many, way too many. It's ridiculous out here. And all styles, too. I mean, we have not just the Chinese martial arts, but I, I think as... San Francisco is, you know, the, the golden gate to Asia, you know, so there's a, a huge uh, Muay Thai community, there's a huge karate, huge judo, huge taekwondo, you know, and then even some of the more obscure martial arts, like say capoeira, were really strong in, um, strike force, which was usurped by uh, UFC several years back, that started here. Mm. So we have a huge MMA scene. Um, it's It's... It's ridiculous. <laughs> it's hard to keep up with. Do you think there's a tipping point? You know, is there a point where there becomes so much martial arts that we're kind of diluting the quality and thus risking people coming in, coming to one of those lower quality schools and thinking, oh, well, this is martial arts and getting a bad yeah, taste? Yeah, defi definitely. Definitely. I think what tends to happen... Actually, I know this. This tends to happen: is um, 
you know, uh, what drives a lot of martial arts schools, with the exception of MMA, perhaps, and some of the, the real traditional schools, is kids, right? That's that's the fundamental, econ- uh, the fundamental economy that most of them are built on, right. on kids. And so you have these parents coming in, and, you know, they're just looking at sort of the bottom line. You know, where is the school? How close is it to me? How much does it cost? And when it's, when, you know, they'll play... Uh, the 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 various schools that well you know I can go over across the street and get cheaper, and so at a certain point you know what does a master do to deal with that and it's just it yeah I totally think there is a tipping point you know I think that uh, it's um, yeah I wish more more people would spread out <laughs> <laughs> get out of the area move out move to other places you know and I think we tend to see. Well, maybe maybe we don't. You know, I I look around our area, which obviously is much more rural, much lower mm-hmm. population density than what you're saying. You know, San Francisco to rural Vermont. Mm-hmm. I don't think we have a ton of things in common in terms of our business landscape. Mm-hmm. But when I think mm-hmm. about the schools that have started, most of them fail. You know, you you mentioned that yeah. you know school owners don't have the business savvy. You know, they they expect yeah. that they're the quality of their instruction, because I don't think anybody starts teaching thinking that they're terrible. Sure. I would hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I started teaching thinking uh, I was okay. Um, right. You know, hoping to get better, but I didn't think I was terrible. Uh, yeah. I think what happens is um, just to keep your business going, you have to make compromises. And at a certain point you just compromise too much. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's tough. Cause I mean, the, it's easy to say that, oh yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna maintain my my ethical standards or what have you. But you know, when you're paying rent, you're trying to keep your door open. Uh, you'll do whatever it takes, really, to kind of keep that going. Uh, and it's hard out there. It really is. It is. So, it, do you have an opinion on full time schools versus part time schools for that reason? Uh, how do you mean? Well. Full, full, some folks will say that inherently a martial arts school that is the sole source of income for the owner is is yeah. going to lack integrity because of the temptation. Oh yeah, I, I I don't I don't ascribe to that. I, okay. I think there are some people that do their you know do the that are so committed and have you know all they do is their school. That's fantastic. You know, I do think there are certainly there are people that that make those compromises and sacrifice things, and you know, uh, certainly there's those um, those people that are that are teaching out of the garage that are excellent. Um, but I, I don't think that's really a factor in terms of um, quality. It's more about the individual than it is that particular, you know, wh- what mode it is. Mm. You know, I mean, some people teach better through a garage. Some people teach better through a big academy. I mean, it, it really, it really, uh, depends. Um, and, and, and there's certain, again, it's, it's sort of that goal state. I mean, like say, for example, one of the business model that gets probably the most criticism in the martial community is the, as we call them, the McDojos, the, uh, the, the big franchise schools. And I mean, there, there is an advantage of the big franchise schools in that, you know, I, uh, I have friends who travel, you know, they would travel a lot for work. And the nice thing about a franchise school is when they travel to another town, they can still train. Mm. And so in that goal state, you know, that's wonderful. They may not be getting this incredibly in depth, you know, intimate relationship with their master, but they still get to train. And that's the important part. Right. Um, so it really depends on what your goal state is in terms of, you know, where you want to go or what, what you want to do with martial arts. Um, and that's different for every person, really. You know, it's very individual. Sure. We started off talking about you know, an inter- interview you'd done, and I'm sure you've done a bunch of them. And when you think back about mm. these interviews that you've done for your magazine, what advice, what you know, kind of wisdom jumps out at you from over the years? You know, are there common uh, themes that you're you're finding when you talk to these folks, or you know, are there? I, I guess I want to make this really open. You know, tell us about some of the interviews. <laughs> oh man, that's a good question. In the sense, well, 
I mean, it depends on the individual because I, I, I range, you know, from new champions to, you know, elder masters to various celebrities and movie stars and stuff. And RZA, rap stars and stuff, you know, uh, everybody has kind of a different take on it. Um, for me personally, um, I, I'm always fascinated by the elder masters because they've had the game for the longest. Mm. They have the most stories and they've survived. Um, you know, the, there's, there's a lot to be said for youth and vigor. And so, you know, like the latest MMA champion, while that's fascinating, you know, who long knows how long they'll stay in the game. And, you know, a lot of that, a lot of things that they, they might say, I shouldn't really characterize that just MMA, but any sort of champion, a lot of it could just be natural ability. There are a lot of people that are born very gifted. And um, so they don't really have as much to offer um, people that aren't gifted, the average person, um, they'll just kind of tell you, oh, yeah, you know, train really hard, you know, be dedicated, you know, it's like, oh, OK, <laughs> you know, give me give me something more of a secret. Give me something, some clue. I mean, I guess I'm on this quest, too. Right. So uh, it, I'm, I'm I'm looking those, for those pearls of wisdom. Um, I mean, uh, one of my favorite uh, Grandmaster John Leung, who's. Uh, up in uh, he's a Hunga kung fu master up in uh, Seattle. Um, I interviewed him, and he was in his uh, oh, I guess he was in his seventies back then. And he we were in Oakland, and he had just come back from jogging that morning in Oakland, which is not a great place to be jogging for an old man. But uh, you know, he he has to jog every day. He's got to go work out every day. And I was like, you know, wow, what 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 is your secret? And he was just, you know, I like to sweat. And uh, <laughs> that kind of nailed it for me, you know. That that's it's very simple. You know, just just work out, just keep doing it, you know, and and find the joy in it. And uh, you know, he's still going strong. I have so much respect and admiration for, you know, his school just celebrated its 50th anniversary, and that's that's just awesome when you hear stuff like that, right? I've heard a lot of our guests echo kind of that same wisdom around continuity and simplicity mm. just, mm -hmm, sure. just keep moving just keep going forward or, or even even keep stepping even if you're staying in the same place right right little every day is better than trying to do a lot one a lot quickly right. you know it's a slow build uh, i think that's also one of the things that that's difficult in terms of marketing uh martial arts is that really it's a lifestyle i mean if you really want to get good at it it's a lifestyle um, and What's you've got to be passionate to for something. I mean, you know, it's, it's in part something you do every day. You know, it's something that you're constantly thinking about, you know, sort of in the back of your mind, you know, like, like you, you read the news, you read, you, you read, you focus on things that might affect your martial arts or have some, uh, meaning there. You know, you, you, you know, you watch what you eat, you, you do your practice, uh, you know, daily. And you're constantly kind of thinking about that. Um, when you watch other people do martial arts, you're, you're kind of looking at what you can, what you can poach, what you can borrow, what you can steal. What do they have that I don't, you know, and can I get that? Um, again, it's that quest. You, you got to keep, keep chipping. Um, you can never kind of become complacent or be like, yeah, I got this. Cause then it's like, well, you got that part of it. You got that skin. Maybe you got that muscle. You know, but there's, there's, you can still go deeper, keep going deeper. Yeah. And there's almost, well, not even almost, I, I would say that there's too much to know that if you spend that much time on one thing, that something else is going to start to fade. You can't be right. good at everything all of the time. Sure. You got to keep juggling things. And I think, <laughs> I mean, in my, in, in my personal experience, you know, life gives me enough bruises that I have to constantly move things around. <laughs> like, oh, my knee's out. My knee's out. I got to work my legs. Yeah. <laughs> my wrist is messed up, so no weapons for a little while. Yeah, I got to work this. I got to work my elbows or something. You know, platform's not working. I got to do something else. Got to kind of keep it moving and vital. <laughs> but, uh, you know. What's been your favorite interview? Like, like you know, when, who... Who's been the one that you said, you know, I, I could talk to this person weekly for the rest oh, of my life? Oh, geez. Oh, geez. So many. Good Lord. Really? Lord. You, you've um, had that many? That, 
that you love this yeah well i mean you know working for comfort tai chi now this is uh, i've been part of kung fu tai chi now for um let's see going on 19 years and prior to that i was a freelance uh uh, writer who not only wrote, I mean, most freelance writers just write about their master, but I had already expanded to different masters because I had, um, you know, I had trained at Shaolin, I had other, you know, and there was all these stories at Shaolin. And so, um, yeah, there's so many, good Lord. I mean, everybody's got their stories. Um, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really, I can't answer that one concisely, I'm afraid. <laughs> Which has been just been too many. I mean, certainly the celebrities are always fun, um, just because they're celebrities. Um, the grandmasters are always interesting. Some of them are so trippy, you know. It, yeah, too many. Good lord. Hmm. <laughs> All right. When you think back over your your martial arts, I mean, you've, you've had quite the martial arts career, and here you are in a role where you're not training for a living but you're still doing martial arts as far as i'm concerned for a living sure Sure. and i know there are stories and you know from last time and the listeners know that stories are a hallmark of this show tell us a great story from your past oh well you know my one of my favorite stories about martial arts was actually um it's not so much martial art martial artsy but uh i i was at um I was in Bodh Gaya, which is uh, where Buddha was lined in India. I was doing a Buddhist pilgrimage, and I was actually in India for for some time because my wife was studying yoga. And then we, after we had done our period studying, um, we we traveled India and backpack traveled around, and we're doing the the pilgrimages or the the Buddhist sites among part of the things we were seeing. And so I went to Bodh Gaya, and uh, I, I you know the, I had a, a a t-shirt on that's a Shaolin Kung Fu. And I ran into this Tibetan monk in the middle of the night. We were eating samosas at this ramshackle food place. And uh, he's like, oh, it's Shaolin Kung Fu. And he, he read it and he was all like, oh, very good, very good. Now, he didn't really speak much English. Um, and I don't really speak any Tibetan at all. We both had a little bit of Mandarin. And, <laughs> and we wound up having this, you know, long a uh, very animate conversation about uh, martial arts and such, you know, and I mean, he would say something like, you know, like, like Hu Jiao, which means like a tiger claw. And then he would make like a tiger claw at me. And then I would do it back and we'd laugh and have more samosas. And, you know, it was just this, this amazing connection to have with this a total stranger. And um, uh, that was just, you know, that was, that was kind of, um, very affirming, very reaffirming in, in the sense of what our community is about. Um, I mean, in the Chinese martial arts, uh, uh, we often say, you know, uh, use martial arts to make friends, which sounds kind of like a, uh, uh, a paradox. Uh, but I think there's something very real about our community and, and something very um, universal that transcends language and, and culture and you know that just kind of gets down to the, the ability to communicate with each other uh in this very sort of sophisticated dialogue but one that's sort of exclusive to our various martial lineages it's a great story mm. i'd like you to tell us about a low point in your life something that you know went off the rails completely and how you were able to use martial arts to set things back on track a low point in my life. Hmm. Uh, oh, okay, here's one. So, um, I was, uh, the second time I went to Shaolin, I wanted to learn uh, drunken style just because, just because, <laughs> drunken <laughs> style. And uh, drunken style is actually based on this other style called detang, which literally means like falling, like doing break falls and stuff, like these crazy. Like, like like break dancing kind of crazy jumps and falls and flips and stuff, which I'd never studied at all, uh, which is kind of a mistake because you really need detong to understand uh, drunken style. And early on, I uh, I cracked my little toe, which uh, you know doesn't sound like much, but you know it's your little toe. And <laughs> so I was going to this um, local uh, bone setter. It was one of the fathers of one of the monks, 
and uh, he was giving me treatments, the traditional Chinese medicine treatments. And, um, you know, that was, that was a uh, great, I, my whole thing was like, you know, just hold me together for this month while I'm training. And then I, you know, I'll deal with it when I get home. And so at the very end, when I was about to leave, um, he prepares this special treatment and he has his, his assistant like massage this weird, it was, it was like a, like almost like a dried apricot that it was soaked in some sort of herb and he massages in my foot for I don't know, a long time, like a good hour or so. He's massaging this weird oil thing in my foot. And I got a really bad allergic reaction. Now, Shell and Temple, especially back then, was very rural. So it was, uh, it was, it was dirty. It was hard to stay clean. And um, so this allergic reaction broke my skin barrier. My foot started to weep. And I contracted cellulitis. Mm. Uh, and cellulitis is a just brutally painful disease or affliction. And uh, um, at that time, I actually had insurance with this program that that would activate the military and fly you out of China. Um, and I was thinking about doing that, but then I thought, well, you know, I'm here with I was training with some some other people, and they're all going to leave, so I just leave with them and not activate it. I mean, I seriously thought about that because, but then I thought, well, then I'd be stuck in China by myself and. That would be really rough. So, so I just sort of grinned and bared it. And, you know, I mean, my foot, my foot swelled up to the, like the size of a football, you know, it was just, just, and I could wipe it down for, and, and in half an hour, it would be just soaking wet because it was just seeping with stuff. It was just awful and just intensely painful. So I get to the air, you know, the airplane and everybody had brought like various uh, muscle relaxants and painkillers because we were all, tra- you know, training for a month. Uh, and they all like kind of gave them to me and <laughs> I was drinking all this liquor, trying to just trying to pass out on the plane. I could not cause I was in so much pain. And I literally got off the, um, the, uh, airplane and, uh, went right to the emergency room and got some antibiotics and it was all cleared up and that was cool. Um, but, uh, a little while later, it turned out that because of the cellulitis and because of the Chinese medicine that was used, that I developed uh, an allergy to Chinese medicine and, or to this particular kind of Chinese medicine, uh, tea da jiao, which is a, uh, it, it's a liniment commonly used in Kung Fu. Um, literally means like fall hit uh, medicine or wine. Um, and it's like an alcohol based herbal liniment that you use for bruises and sprains and stuff. And I've, I've lived off this stuff for, you know, my entire martial career, it's kept me together. Um, and so I had like this injury, this groin injury, you know, I pulled my leg or something, pulled my groin. And um, generally, you know, you can't put like tiger balm or white flower oil or, or, or even like Bengay near your groin because it's right. just, you can't do that, right? I've done so, it, it's not uh, advisable. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's a mistake you make once. Yes. And so I so I was using this tea da joe, this, 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 this liniment, which isn't, the heater in that same way. And turns out that, you know, I had this allergic allergy and, uh, my, my, my testicles just blew up like a freaking grapefruit. It was so awful. It was so painful and itchy. I mean, that kind of itch that you just want to take a pencil and stab yourself. And, um, I mean, all my Kung Fu brothers were all like, Oh, I bet your wife really likes that. I was like, dude, I'm in serious pain here. <laughs> So, I mean, I went to the doctor and they put me on steroids and stuff. And thank goodness that my doctor at the time was Chinese. And so he had like a sense of, you know, like uh, what, what this was. You know, he knew he knew when I said Tita Jiao, he knew what I was talking about. But, um, yeah, that was pretty brutal when, when you're uh, – when, whenever your genitals are <laughs> severely injured, uh, life is bad. That was bad. And to to date, I can't like take any of the, that kind of medication. I can't do those liniments. Even certain like band aid adhesives will make me have a very strong allergic reaction. Yeah. So. What do you use instead? But. Uh, I use well. I still can use Tiger Balm and white flower oil and Bengay, and uh, there's some Ayurvedic stuff I use sometimes. Um, but um, yeah, I just kind of have to tough it. I, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've had several of my, my Kung Fu brothers and sisters went into uh, 
uh, traditional Chinese medicine, and they all say, well, you know, I could start testing you, and we could figure out what herb it is, and I could make a special liniment. I'm like, you know, I really don't want to go through that. I'm just going to live without it and uh, see how it goes, you know? So, Was there a lesson for you in all that? Was there a lesson? Uh, hmm. Um, I guess the lesson is be careful on your medicine. Watch your medicine. <laughs> Don't overdose on medicine. Don't overdose. That's the lesson. Don't overdose. You know, uh, I mean, I think it's easy to kind of rely on this sort of stuff, you know. And, um, I mean, that's sort of the, 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 the gateway to addiction when you start relying on something overly, you know, whether that be, you know, Coke for liniment or caffeine or who knows what, you know, PEDs, whatever it is. You just got to be careful. Mm. Be mindful. When you think back over the folks that you've trained with, and, and actually, let's let's open that up. The folks that have had influence on your martial arts, who who kind of jumps to the top? Who are... Who's the one or, you know, maybe there's a couple at the top that you look at and you say, this person, these people were just paramount in who I am as a martial artist today. Hmm. Well, I mean, I have a fair long list of masters, right? I mean, my Kung Fu master Wing Lam, who gave me my first complete traditional system. Um, I'm discipled under a Shaolin monk, Shi De Chang, um, who I just saw a few months ago. And, uh, you know, he kind of, Keeps me going. Um, uh, my fencing master, uh, 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 Michael DeSaro. Um, I mean, there's been a lot, really. There's been a long chain chain of people uh, that uh, that I've been under. Um, to single out a certain person would be tough. Um, yeah, there's been. I mean, I, all all my teachers have given me something. You know. And even a lot of the people that I interview and work with, I, I try to get something, try to get one thing at least. Not always doable because of the, the time is so limited. Mm. And sometimes they're talking about something that's so alien to me that I really just can't incorporate it. I mean, beyond sort of a theoretical level or an imaginatory level that, oh, well, that exists. Um, but, um, but yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm always... I'm always open. I'm always looking for stuff. You know, I guess that's part of being a magazine publisher is I kind of have to stay on top of that, you know, or being, you know, I gotta have to constantly looking for fresh stories, you know, constantly looking for something. I mean, you know, martial arts magazines have been with us for a long time now. And, uh, so many things, uh, we we've read before. In fact, just this morning I rejected, a an article on knife defenses because i mean how many times have we seen knife defenses you know is it a new knife defense that's no, the same old knife defense I'm like, well i don't really want to i don't think my i don't think my readers are really gonna be that interested in that right, right. i mean it, you want stuff you want fresh stuff um which isn't to say that you know you shouldn't know your knife defenses or you know that that there's anything wrong with basics um it's just even with basics you need to take a novel angle that um that is somehow inspiring or illuminating or, or provide you with something that you can incorporate into your training as opposed to just, you know, here's, here's what you do if somebody sticks a knife in your face. Sure. Um, sure. And that's got to be a, a difficult reconciliation between new novel material with, you know, a, a, a tradition, a practice that values, as we've already talked about today, being well, I mean, the old nice and... The nice thing about tradition and practice is that, you know, it, it is old and you can keep going further back. You know, I mean, you can keep digging. There's so many stories in, uh, say, going back to the Three Kingdoms again, and the, that, that uh, uh, you know, Guan Gong and that, 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 that particular weapon. There's so many stories there that I've yet to tap. Um, so and in terms of keeping... The past fresh, that's actually that's actually easier than it sounds. You just need to research. You just need to dig at it because um, a lot of people sadly don't know it. And that's very much, I see part of my role is, is building that context and, and, you know, 
I mean, retelling those legends and uh, passing that stuff down. I mean, that's really, that's the whole sort of, I mean, tradition just means that um, you are honoring your ancestors. Um, I think a lot of people misinterpret that to be that um, you're, you're, you're doing literally what they did. Um, which to some degree just doesn't make sense because I mean, for example, Guan Gong um, is a somewhat mythical character. I mean, he was really like, you know, he was, I think he was like seven feet tall, eight feet tall, he was a huge dude. And of course that's a sort of a ludicrous combination thing. That's a mythic thing. Um, he was also bright red. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, yeah, I don't know if that really, I think that's a mythical thing. At the same time, there's, there's lessons in that. Um, Actually, there was a, one of the things I really liked about uh, um, Donnie Yen did a version of the he took on the the Guang Gong legend uh, in a film recently. Oh man, what was the name of that? But um, he interpreted the bright redness as the fact that his face was spattered with blood, which I thought was really funny. Mm. But um, I was you thinking know, maybe I mean, sunburn. Yeah, <laughs> that too. Um, but I mean, those sort of things. Uh, you can keep them fresh in the retelling, you know. I mean, like, you know, that, that's a classic example. What was the name of that movie? General's Blade, I think. Hmm, something like that. You're um, far but, more uh, spun up on those films than I am. Yeah. I, I, I try, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It was actually a beautiful piece of choreography he does with with the Kwan Dao. I, I love watching Donnie work the, the ancient best. weapons. Um, so good. But so there, you got a situation where you you've taken this ancient myth and he sort of reinterpreted it and made it. Uh, made it vital again. And, um, so I, I, I don't have th that. That's not, um, as challenging as it might seem. It's just, it's just a process of doing re good research. Uh, who would I you want to interview? If you could, if you who could, would I want to interview? Take, that, um, take your recorder. Yeah, I, would, time. I, I wouldn't mind getting Donnie again. Mm. <laughs> I've actually never interviewed Donnie myself. Um, I mean, and, I've, I've interviewed Jackie, and Jackie's always great, and uh, Jet, of course. I mean, uh, the, there's a lot of... Um, oh, you know who I'd really love to get, who I've never been able to, would be Sammo Hung. Mm. Um, Sammo Hung is one of my... I, I feel he's always, like, one of the unsung heroes of... He's he's just on fire now. He's The, the kind of films he's been doing, particularly, he's been doing a lot of um, choreography work, and I just I just love his stuff, you know? He's... he's <laughs> he's such a great filmmaker. He's such a great he's, choreographer. He's fantastic. And I you think know. I said this when we talked last time, the, the, the mm -hmm. mystical episode that all of the listeners are, are probably gnashing their teeth at, at, the, at the mention of, because <laughs> it's never going to come out. But yeah. I, th I think it was in talking with you last time, I, I mentioned Sammo Hung as, in my opinion, the most underrated martial arts actor of all time. Yeah, I, I would concur with you there. I think people tend to overlook him, but... Uh... You know, he just delivered over the course of his career, and still, even today, his latest films are are, are just phenomenal. I mean, there's certainly a, a, a certain kind of cinema that that's that's Sammo Hung cinema, just like you know the Jackie Chan style of Jackie Chan movies, where there, there's a it, it's not it's not Hollywood. It, it doesn't move like a Hollywood film, but um, he's he's just brilliant work, at, and and just so inspired by him. So utterly fantastic. You know, I just love watching him move. You know, to see such a such a big man and and, and an old man now too. You know, to be able to move like that is just just yeah. inspirational. You know, it's Incredible. it's awesome. It's just awesome. So, tell um, us about what what you've got going on. You know, we'll, we'll start to wind down a little bit here. Okay. You know, we, we've talked about the magazine just a bit, but you know, tell us yeah. more. Well, um, so with the magazine, uh, we have our our print magazine, of course, which is still on the newsstand. Uh, we're we're clinging to that newsstand as as long as we can, as long as there's still newsstands, which are getting few and far between <laughs> nowadays. Um, and we also uh, we also do web content. So every day, uh, excuse me, every week we publish uh, uh, a new something new uh, in terms of an article. But we also have a YouTube channel, and we do. Uh, uh, sweepstakes giveaways, um, all sorts of things. For them. So it's it's kind of like, I mean, to be honest with you, the the, the website has kept the print uh, magazine alive because um, it, it's much easier to monetize uh, the web and much cheaper and much more efficient 
to produce things on the web than it is to do things in print. However, being a traditionalist, I, I love print and um, and I'm going to cling to it as long as I possibly can. Um, the other big project that I'm doing, um, oh, one more thing with the, with the magazine first, is that we put on an annual tournament, and this year will be our 10th anniversary. Uh, oh, cool. Uh, the Tire Claw Elite Kung Fu Magazine.com championship, which we do here in San Jose. And uh, it's a two-day event, so... Um, and it, it's... Um, you know, it's fun because um, because of our Chinese connections, we get some nice dignitaries over. Like this year, we're anticipating getting Wu Bin back, who was Jet Li's coach and uh, a real former and shaper of Chinese martial arts. Um, but then people from all the country come, and then our whole area comes, and so it's it's a it's a big fun event. Um, and uh, but on my other project that I'm doing is I'm um, I'm on uh, LRA Networks. Man at Arms, Art of War, which is a reality show where we uh, construct ancient weapons and test them out. And our main host is Danny Trejo, and I'm uh, one of two weapons experts that come on and and, and we <laughs> help supervise the test. So yes, yeah, so sometimes test things. It's pretty fun. It's pretty exciting that it's um, it's from a uh, a group of weapons makers, Baltimore Knife and Sword, who are just phenomenal at what they do in terms of making these ancient weapons. And uh, um, it's real fun because uh, I think a lot of people, very few martial arts still play with sharps. You know, Kung Fu doesn't. You know, I mean, there's some people that do cutting in the Japanese and Chinese circles, but most of us play with kind of dull weapons. And so it's a whole different animal when you actually sharpen something and see if you can actually cut something with it. Um, and then also just to, to kind of get a sense of how these weapons were made and how they feel, how they balance, how they perform. Um, that's pretty fun. I mean, you know, I got to, uh, last season we got to play with ballistic dummies. I've never got to stab a ballistic dummy. That's pretty fun, you know? And, uh, we, we cut up some, uh, pig carcasses and stuff and made a giant ballista and, Shot javelins into a car <laughs> across a parking lot. Wow. It was great fun, you know. Wow, so the, and they pay you for this. They pay me for that. Isn't that ridiculous? <laughs> it's so <laughs> fun. The you best know? job in get, the world. Get to hang out with, uh, um, you know, the, these great makers and yeah. Danny Trejo. Danny's just he is such an inspiration. You know that Danny's actually made more movies than Jackie Chan. I believe he's upwards to, to like three hundred movies now. But I've got to ask and, you about him because and and anybody who doesn't know that name you know who we're talking about you've you know seen him talk, yeah, you've seen a him picture, a dozen yeah. times at minimum sure and his character always seems to be based around being the scariest person imaginable how <laughs> scary is he in real life if if, if one end is, is fuzzy he's... bunny and the other end is the way we perceive danny trejo he's actually very generous and very sweet and uh and amazingly authentic um he uh I mean, you know, I, the last season was, was the first time I've ever done anything like this. And so he actually took me aside a couple of times and, and, you know, was very encouraging, encouraging and supporting. And I mean, he's in his 70s now. And we were doing these things where, I mean, you have to stand on set. And it was, it was this, this harsh kind of warehouse that we were filming in. And so, you know, you're on cement and asphalt all day. And he was there. He was spot on. He was always standing there, more present than, than the rest of us. And uh, um, but I mean, he can so so <laughs> turn on that 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 evil dead, the machete. You can totally turn that on. I mean, at one point, I remember our director wanted him to do something again. And he was all like, "Well, you know, what school are you from? Where'd you go to school?" And the guy told him, and he said, "Oh man." When I was young, we used to kick the asses of people from that school. And he just gave him that death stare, and the, and the director just froze for a second. And then Danny was just like, oh, just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> you know, I mean, he, he could totally turn it on. But um, <laughs> the only thing that was amazing about Danny was that uh, he did a lot of the weapons tests himself, and he always stuck it. Now, we've got two professional um, stunt people, uh, Mark Zoror and uh, Crystal Santos, who... Uh, do most of the weapons tests. And I mean, both those that they are, they make their living as stunt people. So they're, you know, physically in fantastic shape and, uh, and very, um, uh, active, uh, martial artists. And, 
some of the you know doing some of those cuts and stuff is pretty challenging. But uh, Danny never missed. He never missed. He always just like stuck the cut. He always sliced it true. I was like, wow, you know. <laughs> Does he have a background in martial arts? Well, you know, he was a he was a boxing champion in prison. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's how he got started. Actually, it was for um, the movie Runaway Train. He was asked to train Eric Roberts, um, and uh, uh, after he got out of the joint, and uh, and they liked him so much, they put him in as like the boxing, the a boxing character, and that that should have got him started. So, I mean, he's in great shape. He's he's, he's burly. Yeah, yeah. You know, he, so, he always um, looks solid when I see him on screen. You know, and it's like, I mean, I'm, you know, we're talking about elder, um, uh, elder masters. I mean, you know, he is in his seventies, and still very strong and very present. You know, um, so, so yeah, he do, he does have that boxing background, and you know, I mean. It, Prison boxing champion. <laughs> That's got to be pretty hardcore, right? Yeah, I. I uh, he, he just dropped so a new good. documentary about uh, how to survive in prison, oh, really? uh, which I've been meaning to see. I got it. just came available that I on iTunes. I've been meaning to rent that. He's but so um, yeah, yeah. I don't know how he does it? Yeah. I, I feel like He's, he turns out more material than I have time to watch. Yeah, seems that way, huh? Yeah. And then there's a range. I mean, not only does he do, do these, you know, these hardcore badass characters and these crazy B movies like three headed shark. He does like a lot of kids movies and a lot of voice work, you know, he was in spy kids and stuff like that. And so uh, it's a wide range of stuff he does. So, but uh, it's been a real honor to work with him. It's been a real honor to work with that whole cast, you know, yeah, L Ray network. Right. Um, that's uh that's uh Robert Rodriguez's baby. And, uh, um, Rodriguez actually appeared in the in the final episode of season one, so I got to meet and talk to him. And I interviewed Rodriguez many years ago because um, El Rey Network has um, the uh, Shaw Brothers collection, mm. and they they do this thing the, the, the every Tuesday night it is now it's the five finger one arm five pole or eight pole Shaolin exploding death touch Tuesdays, and where they they do marathons of uh, of Shaw Brothers movies, and uh, sometimes they do them on Sundays too, and um, you know, they now the Shaw Brothers collection, they um, uh, a lot of people have it, right? I mean, Hulu has it, Amazon Prime has it, you know, Netflix has it, but most of them only have about a dozen of the big titles. And uh, Rodriguez got the rights to broadcast, like, I think it's like 250 plus films. He's got a lot of, more than anybody else. And so they're they're showing not sort of just the classics, like, there's his chamber or what have you. Um, but they're, they're, they're showing a lot of the, um, you know, more obscure stuff like, uh, Oh, house of traps, which is one of my favorites, you know, those, these, these Why classic. Is Why is that one of your favorites? Oh, cause it's so absurd. It's really absurd. It's Shaw brothers being so absurd that it's just delightful. It's, uh, have you ever seen it? I haven't. Uh, it's like these, these guys have to penetrate the house of traps. And so they go into these things and like blades fly out of them and pits of <laughs> fire and stuff. And it just, just, it's crazy absurd. You know, you watch this thing like, wow, not only did somebody, you know, conceive of this film, they actually tried to, to make these, you know, walls of knives shooting at people. This is way before CGI, right? So it's like, wow, what is going on here? You know, um, there's some great, I mean, Shaw Brothers, they were they were such a grindhouse, and they turn out some movies that are just so wonderful because they're just so bizarre, you know. <laughs> There's an authenticity, I think, to to that rapid production that that you just kind of have to, you know. I, I would assume they were weren't doing too many takes. So you yeah. Get it right. Yeah, and I'm sure they were just kind of writing it as they go, you know, which is what makes the choreography just outstanding because you look at the some of those fight scenes where it's just, you know, two dozen moves in a single shot as, and they're all super complex, you know, even though it, it's kind of a weird looking fight because people are doing flips and crazy things. But uh, still, if you just kind of look at that from the level of how could you do that fight, you know, in one shot, that's amazing. You know, it's really could have sort of been the inspiration for cinema nowadays. I, I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, a lot more 
movies now where you're having these long, continuous single shot things as opposed to the old John Wayne, you know, cut to him, throw the haymaker, cut to the guy getting the haymaker, hit by the haymaker, cut back to him throwing another punch. You know, now you got some beautiful stuff like uh, John Wick had some great stuff and Atomic Blonde, that, that staircase sequence, uh, you know, Netflix uh, uh, Daredevil had some really nice stuff. And even 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 Black Panther had that really nice casino fight, even though that was digitally stitched and stuff. It was so complex and uh, a nice continuous scene of action. I thought um, the fight brilliant. scenes in Black Panther were completely unsung. Every other aspect of the movie was heralded. <laughs> right. And I'm sitting there in the theater saying, why is no one talking about the combat here? It's fantastic. Right, right. Oh, yeah, was, I'm so with was, you on that. Was yeah, so the, 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 there was there was some really excellent choreography going on there, you know, and. I mean, I'm a real sucker whenever you get an extended scene, you know, anytime when you're, when you're doing a fight scene and it's one shot and they get past a dozen, two dozen moves, then you're like, wow, okay. They had to really kind of bear down and pull that together. So, I mean, maybe that's, you know, coming from a Kung Fu route where we do have things like sparring sets and, you know, where we have to like do a whole sequence of movements with a partner and knowing how tough that is, you know, see, seeing that on, on the big screen, is just, uh, I mean, to me, that's really exciting. You know, that's when choreography is is super cool. You know, especially now with uh, some of the cinematography that people are getting away with is just awesome. You know, I'm really um, yeah. thrilled to see that happening on the big screen now. I agree. So, when we were talking about what you've got going on, one of the things that we kind of missed, and I want to make sure that we get this in, and for for folks that are driving or whatever, don't forget. Show notes, <laughs> whistlekick, martial arts, I don't want you crashing or, you know, grabbing the, the arm of the person on the treadmill next to you and trying to write on them. Um, how, how do we, how do we get a hold of you? Someone wants to get a hold of you, you know, rattle off some links and email and social media or whatever else you want to share with us. And then we'll uh, start the best winding places, down. best parts is this through our website, com. So um, that, that's the main hub of our website. And we have, we, we have, uh, uh, Twitter account, and we have, uh, uh, that's what, uh, KFM underscore KFTC, and we have uh, Facebook, which is Kung Fu Tai Chi, um, and we have a YouTube channel, which is um, Kung Fu, again, which is Kung Fu, Kung Fu Magazine. Um, it's all, it all spirals out to Kung Fu Magazine.com. You just get there, you can get the links to all of our other stuff, depending on whatever social media you're on, and uh, that, that's the easiest way to get a hold of me, absolutely. All right. Right on. Well, I appreciate you being here. You've been so generous, so graceful in, in coming back a second time for what I'm going to say. And then, you know, nobody's going to believe me, but <laughs> what has been a better episode? You know, we, we know each other a little bit now, so we were able to kind of dance in a sense. But I'd love for you to just kind of send us out with some, some last words, some parting wisdom, whatever you want to call it. Parting wisdom. Hmm. Uh... Hmm. Keep at it. Don't don't uh, don't just grab that skin. Go for that marrow. Go deep. Yeah. Okay. We'll Play for the long game. <laughs> okay. Nice. No this this was this was good and and I hope that. It went okay. Um, honestly, we're kind of, sure, sure. I think, transitioning into this this kind of dive right in with both feet format. It, <laughs> it happened accidentally, but as yeah. I've become more confident as an interviewer, yeah, it's been leading to some interesting stuff. Eh, whatever works for you. It was fun. Well, good. good. Um, yeah, and, and again, thank you. Thanks for coming back. I, I owe you a, a huge debt. Ah, very good. Well, no worries. <laughs> All right. My pleasure. Like I said, you could, you let me plug my stuff, so it's all solid. Yeah, I'll, I'll always let you plug your stuff. You know, whatever whatever you've got going on. You know, if you, there's something something big you're pushing, or you know, by all means, shoot over the um, the tournament stuff. Or I don't know if I mentioned to you last time we we did a calendar site, just trying to oh, okay. compile mm -hmm. everything. MartialArtsCalendar.com because I mm -hmm. name things as bluntly as possible. Because mm -hmm. um, there, there isn't there isn't one source for all the martial arts events we have going on. Yeah, that's tricky. Um, I mean, we we have a calendar uh, within our website, but um, yeah, we had to. <laughs> it actually crashed our site at one point because we 
we had like a, we didn't have it firewalled well enough. Oh. So um, I, I take it. I take it you filter everything, right? That people send it to you and you filter it. Yes. Yeah. Or nothing you, goes live open without, source kind of without a without yeah. eyeballs. Yeah. Yeah. But do they fill out a form or do they send yeah. you stuff or no? They they fill out a form. They do all the work and we just kind of mm-hmm. review it and and make a couple of modifications yeah. if need be and then push it out. Yeah. Keep an eye on that because um, we had some issues with ours. Okay. Um, one of the things that, that was really key for us, because uh, we had to rebuild it all, because it literally crashed our site, was having, um, we don't really have a uh, a, a CAPTCHA kind of thing, but uh, akin, akin to that, having like a, a question, mm. you know. Um, that, that automated. Uh, yeah, you got to watch for the spam bots, because that's what killed us. Okay. Um, we, we also did a, do a sweepstakes thing, which is a similar thing where they fill it out. And, uh, yeah, the spam bots just murder you because once they kind of get in, it's hard to get them out. And then, then they just come in tor- torrents and, yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah, it took us out. Good advice. I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Best of luck with it. Thank you, Mr. Chang, for coming on the show today, for sharing your stories, and for all the wonderful work you're doing at Kung Fu Tai Chi Magazine. I really appreciate it. Please keep it up. Keep martial arts magazines alive. If you want to check out the show notes... I hope you head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We've got links and photos to all the things that we talked about today. And hopefully you'll go check out Kung Fu Tai Chi Magazine because it is a wonderful product with some great writing, much of it from today's guest. If you want to check out our products, whether they're at whistlekick.com or on Amazon or any of the other places you can find them, please do. We would love to count you as a customer. That's all I've got for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.